Act 21 Convention, Orlando, Florida, 2018. I am Hunter Drew, and I have the honor of introducing our next guest. He goes by Tex. Tex is a friend, a mentor, and a man who's been throwing ro ropes for quite some time now. He's a moderator at the Fraternity of Excellence. He's active on Twitter, and you can find a majority of his writing over at texasdom.com. Now, when I first came across Tex's work, it's when he joined the original Men of March, our 31 DTM campaign, a campaign that I started and then I failed. And he looked at me and said, hey, stop being a pussy. Work a little bit harder. Huh. OK, roger that, sir. Since then, we've been best friends. And though he never explicitly said, you can hit me up any time you have an issue, I took advantage of that. So every time I needed an issue, every time I was going through personal matters, my family, I'm pretty sure when my wife met him, she gave him a bigger hug than myself. He's a man who puts himself out there to anyone who needs it. He's a man that has created a resource and gone, thrown everyone on his back, and he will carry you to that finish line if need be. So let's give it up for Tex. So if Hunter is the uh, el dwarf Gimli, I guess I'm the elder white wizard Gandalf or something like that. So. <laughs> I'm gonna work with it. I like the Lord of the Rings. I have lived my entire life to be here right now for this moment. So have you. We all came together for a reason. Um, we took it on ourselves to fly out here and get here. Everybody's talked about it. We've listened to a lot of great speakers. But every single bad decision I've made, every single dead end road I've gone down, every single undesirable woman I dated before I met my wife, Every covert contract I have written, and I have written a million of them, has led me to this day right here in front of you. So, When I got out of college, the space shuttle blew up and I had to go to work teaching high school. And there was a um, class I was forced to teach. It was called uh, Earth Space Science. And it was for the kids that couldn't do chemistry and biology. They were just not the sharpest sticks in the quiver. So at the end of the first semester on the space part of this whole thing, I said, okay, I'm going to have this um, lecture, folks. I want you to put your notebooks down. I want you to not worry about being tested on this. I just want you to listen. And I gave the lecture of a lifetime. It was on black holes, earth, space, time, theory of relativity. I mean, I knocked it out of the park. I was so patting myself on the back during this whole thing. So at the very end, I said, does anybody have any questions? And little Mary Catherine in the back raised her hand. And I thought, okay, this is going to be good. She really got into this really well. She said, Coach, does this have anything to do with the Bermuda Triangle? And I went, opened up the window, stuck my head out, and just screamed. So um, I got out of coaching right after that. So why am I here? I am here to talk to you a little bit about um, how I got to where I'm at, and we're going to talk about something called DNS, which is dominance and submission, but I want you to know one thing. I am you. I have walked the same walk. I might be a little older version than you. There's one or two people I might be a slightly younger version than you in here, but not too many. Um, I've gone through the battles. I've done a lot of things that have gotten me to this point, uh, some good and some bad. Um, 30 years ago, I got married. I was the most blue pill guy in this room. I listened to Donovan's little uh, Fabulous Four and all of his things that he did this morning. I'm right there with him. I made a lot of mistakes early on. I dated a lot of bad women before I finally met my wife. My wife's a good woman, but single mom, check mark right there. Um, and I thought I could do everything right if I was just a nice guy. Thank you, Dr. Glover. Uh, great book. Uh, one of the first ones I ever discovered, by the way. And so everything went along pretty good. I, I'd gone through college. I was a bouncer and a bartender, and I had a security company thing at the Summit in Houston for rock concerts. Man, I was living the dream. I was spinning plates. Things were going along really, really well. Decided to settle down, got married, and all of a sudden the sex dried up. We all know the story. Things weren't so good. But the one thing that I look back at now is that I don't blame her at all. She just did what she needed to do to do what she needed to do. She never cheated on me or anything like that. It's just she was eventually forced to lead. This was my fault. I gave up leadership. The king abdicated his own throne and stepped aside. If you go back to the Lord of the Rings thing, right? Um, 
the king in one of those kingdoms where he was all, you know, just sitting back there all zombie-like and somebody else was running the kingdom. That's what it was. Only one person could drive the bus when you've got two people in a relationship. She was driving our bus. It wasn't that she wanted to. It was that she had to because I was out dicking around, doing things, you know, working hard, making the money, coming home, drinking the beer on the weekends, drinking the Jack Daniels, watching the football. Oh, and then, oh my God, DVRs hit and cable TV really hit in the 80s, right? 90s. Now I got football on four nights a week, pro football, and I got college footballs on Saturdays, and I mean, I'm just sitting there. I became Peter Griffin, the family guy, man. I was that guy. It was, it was ugly. So along the way, we uh, raised two kids. One of my sons with me here today. We did a pretty good job um, as parents. We were on the same page parenting, which is a huge thing if you're a parent. Um, you, your wife and you need to be on the same page. Um, that makes life so much easier and the kids get this consistency. So we did a good job parenting our kids. We did a shitty job parenting our relationship. So by the time everybody had moved out and we were sitting there by ourselves looking at a wiener dog thinking, now what? What do we do now? Eventually, I kind of went my little way. She went her way. I was miserable. She was miserable. It's a sad way to live your life. And we were kind of locked in, golden handcuffs, great job, big house, mortgages, the whole nine yards. We owned rental properties. We had a business together. Um, lots of things that went in that, in that regard. So eventually, we finally had both had enough, and we were searching, trying to figure out what we were going to do. And we were miserable. I was in therapy. By the way, don't be ashamed to go to therapy. I had a female therapist who actually... When I started talking about dominance and submission to her and talking about, you know, the things I like to do, uh, she was cool with it. And in fact, there's a, a modal of therapy called EMDR, which is pretty impressive stuff if you're trying to break loose some bad memories and things. But I digress. So at some point, she had suggested to me to start spending some more time by myself. But instead of jerking around, playing guitar, watching TV, start thinking about what makes me happy. And I had my girl do the same thing. Sit down, figure out what makes you happy. Let's not talk about it now, just try to figure it all out. And we danced around it and danced around it. Eventually, we started talking divorce. And the D word had never entered our vocabulary. We called it the D word for 25 years or so. And then finally, we were like, you know what? This isn't working. We'll sell it all, split it down the middle, go our separate ways. But neither one of us wanted to do that, right? We still loved each other. It was something that was in our hearts. And I know we talk about don't get married. You hear all the different things that you've heard this week. Um, there is true love there. I mean, it's still there. There's love. And we love each other. I, I don't want to be with anybody but her. That's just the way I am wired. I don't believe that's one I just these days because I'm living a red pill life these days. So eventually we got to this point. We got to the final drive. She was going to go to the airport to go out to uh, fly to Alabama to visit the grandkids. I have three, which are awesome, by the way. Um, I'm thinking we're driving down this lonely road, going through the north side to get to the airport. It's raining like hell. The ditches are filled with water, the whole nine yards. And then we, we have that moment where she says, hey, I, I really want to mention something to you. I want to, I want to talk to you about something. And you know that feel in your gut when your wife says, I want to talk to you about something. And I knew it was coming. I'm thinking she's going to be gone for 10 days. We've got a separation in our future. We need to do this. She's going to be gone. This is going to be good. I can go get drunk every night or whatever I need to do to take care of me. And uh, she said, hey, um, I've been studying about what makes me happy and who I am and all that. And she said, I think I'm a submissive. And I was like, what? I mean, she runs her own company. And, and that's also a fatal flaw if you work with your wife in, in the same company. I, I would go in there and kind of assist her with some bookkeeping and things like that. And eventually I became her employee and that transferred back to the house, which was another one of the issues that we dealt with. But the woman says to me, she goes, I think I'm a submissive. I'm like, yeah, I can maybe see that. Okay. She said, I want you to think about something. I would like you to think about becoming my dominant, my dom. <laughs> I about ended the truck right up about there. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, are you serious? Okay. And my first reaction was, yeah, sure. I got this. Yeah, no problem. And inside of me, I'm going, holy crap. What am I going to do now? And so we got to the airport. I walked her up, and I got to the ticket counter, and the Continental or the United lady behind the counter says, she goes, oh, you're walking her up here to make sure she gets on the plane so you can go have fun, right? 
just making a, a stupid blue pill joke. And I'm like, no, I'm walking her up the plane because I want to make sure she's safe. And that sparked something in her when I said that. And I was real freaking serious about it. Freaking, by the way, not fucking. Um, <laughs> so I walk her over to the little Starbucks coffee shop there in the terminal. I couldn't go through security. We were there early because I'm obsessed about getting to the airport early, ass fits. Um, so we're sitting there having coffee and talking, and we actually had the first passionate kiss we'd probably had in two years sitting in that airport. It was a fucking mind-blowing experience to me. I got her on the plane, I went home, and I spent 10 days researching this dominance and submissive lifestyle. I thought, okay, she wants to do something to try to save our marriage. She thinks this is who she is. Is that dominant who I am? And I've always been pretty alpha until I just, for some reason, decided to give up. And I just gave up, you know, lack of sex, whatever. Jack talks about intimacy. Men need intimacy, at least I do. Um, I wasn't getting it. I just wasn't, you know, I, I want to be with the woman in bed. I he was talking about this. It could have been my story, Jack. I mean, I was exactly where I was. I mean, I was a lot of empathy about her brother. But so I go to, I go to research this thing, and I'm, I'm seeing some crazy shit out there, right? So um, keep kind of moving a little bit, and I figure out what it is. It's a total power exchange. It's where she trusts me enough to give up all of her control, all of her power. And she says, okay, I want you to lead me. I want you to lead this family. I want you to protect me. I want you to do all these things. I want you to quit asking me to make decisions. I want to give up my power. And, it, and I take it. I willingly take it on, which is a hell of a commitment that you're going to make to somebody. So she's now free to figure out who the hell she is. Now she doesn't have to worry about paying the bills. She doesn't have to worry about the money coming in and do we this, that, and the other. I quit asking her stupid things like, where do you want to go eat? How many times have we all done that, right? What do you want to eat? I don't know. You sit there in the parking lot for 15 minutes trying to hash it out, and each of you trying to figure out which of the other ones wants to do, and it just never works. So the other thing that came up on this was, is this just kinky sex? Because, you know, there's a lot of kinky sex going on in the BDSM world, and DS are two initials in BDSM. So there's a lot of ways we can take that. We'll talk about that a little bit because God knows we all like to talk about sex, right? So is it? Let me ask you a question. What is the fastest selling paperback book of all times? You're kidding, right? Why is that? Think about this. This is like kryptonite to feminists, okay? Because they're looking at this, oh, we're empowered and we're doing this, that, and the other. And yet thousands, if not millions of women are reading this book and masturbating in their bed when their husbands are off doing something else, right? This is like, they're into this. And so I'm sitting here, Rewind about uh, a year prior to the to the final drive. I'm laying in bed. I'm thinking it's over. I'm thinking I got to start. This is this is bad. I've started lifting weights. I started trying to figure out how to take care of myself. I said, okay, I'm going to start losing weight, and um, I ended up dropping. I don't know over about the last ten years, maybe 100 pounds, and uh, started losing weight, exercising. Doing, I mean, the shit tests were beginning. I mean, the shit tests were ramping up, man. Let me tell you. You know, why are you doing that? I was doing P90X. Y'all know who P90X, Tony Horton? Fucking hey, man. I love Tony, right? Tony motivates the hell out of me. Well, his little voice going on every single night, night after night after night on the TV was starting to really give her ammunition for shit tests. Tony's gay. I don't like Tony. I'm like, hey, get over yourself. You know, I'm, I'm losing weight. You're not, right? So we're, we're, doing, we're, we're doing what we need to do. Well, eventually she starts catching up and she starts ramping up her game. So this is all that's going on. So in the meantime, we're still fighting. We're still enemy combatants passing each other in the hallway, sleeping in the same giant ass bed. Okay. Her way over here, me way over here. So I download this book onto my iPad because God knows I'm not going to buy the paper copy, right? No way. And I'm laying in their bed reading it. And this is, this is awful, awful chick for me. It's, it's enlightening, man. You'll learn a lot about women if you start to read this book. Just read the first half, second half shit. Um, <laughs> she looks over at me and she says, what are you reading? And I said, I'm reading Fifty Shades of Grey. And she says, she goes, I can't believe you're reading that crap. And just like that, right? And so fat, rewind, fast forward. A year and a half later, I'm actually flogging her ass with a freaking leather flogger, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, I remember when I was reading that Fifty Shades of Grey? <laughs> I got a good idea here. 
So um, we get back to basics. This is, even if dominance and submission is not your thing, even if you're not married, you're on an LTR, you're just a single guy, you want to spin plates. Let me tell you something about Fifty Shades of Grey. That tells me women like sex, and they like it a lot, as Dr. Glover said, and they also like it fairly rough. Women are not going to break. They give birth. Babies come out of them, right? Pretty painful experience to watch. Um, they like to be dominated. They like you to be aggressive in the bedroom. They want you to be vocal in the bedroom. That was something else that I had missed out on completely. Uh, I used to be get in there to two pump chuck, you know, dump, whatever you guys just say all the time. I mean, I was in there, I was out of there, we we're good to go. No wonder she didn't want to have sex. It wasn't very much fun for her probably. Uh, that and me, I was a big fat ass too. So it's like, you know, what, what's the old line we hear about the manosphere? Go look in the mirror, stand there naked, look in the mirror and ask yourself, would I fuck me? <laughs> would you? I mean, think about that. I, at the time, I, I look back and I go, I can't believe she wanted to, I, I expected her to fuck me. You know, I wouldn't, I had no self-respect, you know, and, and that's a whole other rabbit hole. But you got to have masculine and feminine energy. They've got to be polar opposites. They've got to have a spark. You know, you can't take two positive ends of a magnet and expect them to pull together. You got to have a positive and a negative end, and they'll latch onto each other. And I'm telling you, this goes back centuries, thousands, millennia. It goes back. It's a natural order. It's the way men and women, women have been designed to interact for years. Uh, men lead, women follow. And if you find a, a woman, that is exploring her submissive side, uh, you, she expects you to lead. So this is one, Rolo said I could grab one of his, his, uh, his quotes. Frame is everything. Always be aware of the subconscious balance of whose frame in which you are operating. Always control the frame, but resist giving the impression that you are. This is the number one iron rule of Tomasi. I'm telling you, it's all about frame, guys all about frame I don't, in anything you do in this life. That's the first thing you got to work on is your frame. So the interesting thing though is, but resist giving the impression that you are because what happens in a DS is that she expects you to, to maintain the frame. She's asking you to maintain your frame. She's willingly saying, hey, look, create a strong ass fucking frame so I can come live with you and be under it. And so you can take care of me and you can make the decisions and you can allow me to express myself and do things that I've always wanted to do, like bake cookies and go plant flowers and work in the yard and do the little things that make her happy. You know, when you're, you're stressed out about bills, you're stressed out about the, the work, you're stressed out about your husband's a dick, all these different things, you're not baking cookies. You're not coloring with the grandkids. You're not doing the things that make you happy. So no wonder she's miserable as well. So extreme cr f frame control. That is the number one superpower you can come up with in your life. You know, we talk about, we, do, we all need to lose weight. We all need to do all these things. Controlling your own frame. If you can do that, um, you're gonna be light years ahead of just about everybody around you. And the people in your lives are gonna be very appreciative because you're gonna be consistent. You're gonna be calm. You're gonna be able to handle shit when it comes your way. You're gonna be able to lead. It's gonna be something that everyone around you is gonna benefit from. It's a little hard work on our part, but the results are worth it. So when I talk about domin dominant, I'm not talking about domineering. Anybody can run around and go, give me a blowjob. It's time, let's go. Anybody can say, hey, do this, do that, do this, do that. I'm not talking about being domineering. There's a huge difference. Uh, a man needs to be dominant, needs to be in charge. Weak women need not apply. I do not want some milk toast girl with no opinions and nothing going for her as a submissive. The submission is a choice. Women make this choice. Uh, it's an active choice. It's a daily choice that they make every single day when they wake up. This isn't abuse either. You know, we talk about flogging and doing some fun things in the bedroom that are, that are kind of fun, and I won't go into too much of that in, in detail since my poor son's back there having to listen to this. Uh, sorry, sorry, Fitz. Um, here's the thing, right? This is kryptonite to feminists. Um, freedom from the whole feminist imperative. This is, you read about the Tradcon, the housewives, they're on Twitter and they're talking about this, that, and the other, and staying home and being stay home moms and all the things that the feminists tell, tell them you are not quite enough of a woman if you're not out there pounding the pavement, you know, trying to earn the same income as your husband and doing all this crap. 
So these, these women that choose to live this lifestyle or just be a stay-home mom, you know, they're dealing with, with, you know, all kinds of stuff going on there. Yes, they don't have to work. They can stay home, take care of the kids, do this, that, and the other, and sure, that's hard work. I'm not disagreeing. But every one of those has to deal with their girlfriends that are, you know, at some office somewhere that are earning their livings and driving their little Escalades and all the other things that they do these days. And they're, they're treated as less than, less than real women, and they're not. They're the more real women in my mind than the ones that are out there, you know, wearing the pussy hats and protesting Trump and everything else. So let's get into some basics. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to bore you with too many, too many things here, but there's, there's a foundation to a dominant-submissive relationship. And even if you're not in a dominant-submissive relationship, you're in an LTR, you're married, or even if you're just looking to maybe put spin in place one day and get into this marriage thing or whatever, LTR thing, these principles apply to anyone in this room, whether you're into the fun stuff or not. Trust. If you want this woman to allow you to lead, you gotta have to have some trust. If you want to tie her up in the bedroom and do naughty things to her and, and give her 12 orgasms in about 30 minutes, right? And that's very, very possible. Dr. Glover hit that one on the head. Uh, you, you learn a few things. When you start getting into some of these little games that we'll talk about in a minute, you're getting into her biggest sex organ, which is right between her ears, and you start mind fucking her. And you start it in the morning when you wake up and you end it, you know, an hour or two after you guys get started. We laugh about guys, you know, going for 15 minutes, but some of this stuff can go on for a while. You got to have trust. You got to have communication. What was the biggest thing that girl and I learned is that we can't read each other's minds and we expected each other to read our minds. And so you, you get to the feeling that, hey, I got to ask, guess what? Every time I ask, I have a problem or have an issue. She's got all my answers. I just have to ask. And then shut the hell up, right? That's the biggest problem. We ask a question, and then we keep talking. So another thing is, if you get your girl in this position where you've got her head on your shoulder, you've, you've got her in a, a rather submissive position, you'll be surprised as to how much more truth will come out of that. And that's the other thing. I mean, this trust and communication thing. Which, who's the, everybody's talking about handing your girl, grabbing cell phones and all this shit. Several years back, before we got right, my girl would pick up my phone to use it to make a phone call, and I'd freak out a little bit. I'm on Facebook talking to people I probably shouldn't be talking to and you know, doing some things I shouldn't be doing, maybe. But it always made me nervous. Now, I can hand her my phone and walk away. Hey, put my phone up for me. She knows the code. She can get in. I could care less. I have nothing on there that I give. I just give a crap. You know, she doesn't like it. She can, she can leave. Okay. There is a freedom there. She knows I can leave at any moment, and I know that she can leave at any moment. And we've talked about that. And I sat there and said, look, if you leave, I'll be sad, but not for that long, you know? And she's the same way. I mean, it's just the way it goes. You can't read the minds. Love and respect. Women need to be loved. Men have to be respected. Um, we, she and I get into a lot of different things in our lives. She refers to me as her warrior. I am her warrior. I'm also her master. There are a lot of little games and stuff you play in a bedroom if you want to. We, we do a little master-slave stuff where I'm, I mean, she literally is my slave. And we sometimes we'll carry that on for a week or two. Uh, sometimes it's just for the night. Sometimes it's just for fun. And I'm her dominant. She introduces me to people as her sir. This is my sir. You want to blow some people's minds? This is, what? You know. Or I don't allow her to talk to anybody. We go to a party. Right? You're not allowed to talk to anybody. Stay right behind me, right behind me on the left side. You know? So, anything I talk about today, if you decide you want to start playing this game a little bit, or you just want to start having a little more fun, fun in your bedroom, spicing things up a little bit, three words safe, sane, and consensual. Okay? Greg was talking to breakfast this morning. He's having his son basically take screenshots of text messages with girls that he's about to go date. In any kind of consent, any kind of things that led up to it. You know, we're talking about having to protect ourselves in the Me Too world right now. That's a great idea. I wanted to make sure I mentioned it, Greg, wherever you are. Um, but consent, con you know, it's got to be consensual. So there's a part of this, and I'm going to kind of delve into the icky stuff for some of you people. Um, but man, this is fun. There's, we call it a scene. And it's a situation where I literally tell her what to wear, tell her where to be, and I'll plan out 
an intricate time for the evening. I have plans. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that to her. I'm going to blindfold her. I'm going to lay her down. I'm going to use ice over here. Maybe I might pull out a magic wand and give her, a few, you know, force about 10, 15 orgasms out of her, this kind of thing. I have it all planned out. She has no idea what's about to happen to her. I just prep her and tell her what I want her to do. And that happens in the morning. It's, and you can do this too, even if you're not into this stuff. Tell your girl, hey, when I get home at 5.30, I want you in that black neg negligee I bought you. I want you to do this. I want to have dinner ready. I want a glass of wine sitting on the counter and lay it out for her. And when we first got started, I did that kind of, I tested her. I want you to be in the kitchen making spaghetti in a, in a skirt that I was telling her about with no panties on just to see if she would do it, right? And sure enough, she did. She got a reward for that. So, <laughs> yeah, like I don't get any rewards out of this, right? <laughs> so. But you're in there, and you plan this thing out. And the thing that I had to learn was to get vocal, because I'm not a vocal guy. But I can literally get in there, and I have to have almost a running dialogue. And I love to blindfold her, because that way if I drop something, she has no idea what I'm doing. Just keep her blindfolded the whole time. And it's, it's just a lot of fun. You can literally almost talk her to an orgasm if you get your words down right. And you got to get vocal in the bedroom if you're ever going to want to have any serious, serious long-term. And, and they don't break, man. Hit it hard like it's your last fuck on earth, right? Make her remember it. Make her walk to the kitchen and her legs are all jelly and wobbly and bow-legged and everything else, right? So... When I first got into this stuff, oh yeah, we're going to have a scene, you know, we're going to go dock some stuff out and we're going to have some fun and this, that, and the other. And I was like, what's the end game? Why am I doing all this? You know, I got a little power trip on my part. I'm kind of enjoying it. And I always get mine in the end. Always get mine in the end. There's, there's, that's non-negotiable. Um, there's a thing called subspace. And I'll touch on it briefly. You can, you can Google it. You can research a little bit. But in impact play, that kind of thing, you can um, you have about five, six minutes of impact play, that kind of thing and it releases a bunch of endorphins, which are just basically the body's natural heroin. And then you wait a few minutes, and literally you look at my watch, wait about five, six, seven minutes, and we do it again, maybe a different toy, maybe something else. And it's just fun stuff for me, but every single time you let her rest, those endorphins build back up. And then after a little bit more impact play, the endorphins release again. So you do this five or six times, she can't talk. She is fucked up and loving it and absolutely loving it. And she absolutely lives for me to get her into subspace. And it's, I know it sounds whack. I ain't gonna lie. It sounds whack to me too sometimes. But when you see the results, I mean, your girl follows you around like a lovesick puppy for a month after a couple of these sessions. I mean, she's just, you're, you're a God. You literally are a God. And, uh, We've had experiences where just doing simple flogging and stuff will give her an orgasm now. I mean, just so much of this is related to the subspace and everything else. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. It really is. So much time I got. Oh, I, got, I love this quote. This is a really bad graphic, but uh, submissives require more attention and can be needier than the average person. And man, you got that right. Okay. They already want all your time. Women want your time anyway. That's your most valuable currency. But submissives really need your time. And they dry up and wither if you don't feed them well. You don't water them well. Um, be careful what you're getting into. I guarantee you, a man or five in this room is going to change his Tinder profile tonight. I am a dom. Or put a big D next to your name. Be careful what you're getting into. You're going to find some kinky bitch and she's going to want you to do things to her that you ain't got no idea what you're doing. So you need to research, plan some things out. You don't want to be that guy. Just trust me, somebody in this room's probably already done that at some point in their life. So there's a lot of different dynamics, this, that, and the other. you got master-slave relationships, daddy-dom little girl, and sometimes the little girl, is, it's, it gets down to... And I, you know, I talk men and women a lot, but there are... Um, dom submissive relationship where the man is the submissive and he willingly walks into it and wants to be that guy and he's got a strong woman who is his dominatrix or dom a or whatever they call her uh, not my thing but one thing I've learned about getting into this world is I don't judge people for their kink I mean some people do some crazy crazy things that make me think I ain't that kinky right I don't care if it's two guys doing a dom submissive relationship it's not my business it's their business it's not my thing I don't necessarily 
want that thing around. You know, it's, it's not what we do. But I've learned through this community to quit being an uptight, judgmental asshole, which is what I used to be. Now it's like live and let live. You know, I, when it comes to what you do behind your own closed doors in your own bedroom, it's none of my freaking business, right? It's none of your freaking business. People just get their kink on, have fun, and enjoy each other. Um, head of household relationships, think grandma, grandpa, think 50s, you know, 50s relationships. They even call it a 50s, 50s head of household. You know, the, the ladies got to wear cotton dresses type of thing, like the, out of the 50s. You know, the pearls and vacuuming and high heels and all that shit. Um, there are couples that actually switch. One night, he's, he's the uh, dom. The next night, she's the dom. They go back and forth. It's what they want to do. It's the way they want to live. And then in the world of, of submissives, I mean, there's littles where, the, where they actually, girls actually um, kind of get down to where they're like 12 and 14 in their head or 16 in their head. And some of them really, really, really little, which pacifiers and diapers and the whole nine yards, which ain't my kink. But again, again, not being judgmental, not my thing. Um, sometimes they get bratty. There's rope bunnies. They like to get tied up with intricate designs and all this stuff. Now, I'm getting into this lecture phase, and I really don't want to do that. What are some of the pitfalls? I'll tell you what, too many rules. The first thing they want to do, every couple that gets into this, we're going to make a set of rules, by God, and we're going to have this, 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 and this, and this, and this, and this. Or we're going to draw up a contract. You saw that if you ever watched one of those goofy movies. Um, keep the rules simple if you're going to do this. A couple of rules. Don't make it too hard. Just spend all your life enforcing rules when that's really not the, the idea about this. The idea is to make a connection with somebody that you totally trust, and she totally trusts you, and you can communicate, and you can have that intimacy, you can have all those things that you really do want within a framework. That's all it is. It's just a framework. There is no one way. I always put that down at the bottom here. Um, there's people that will lead you to believe that their way is the only way. That's crap. There's every single couple out there decides exactly how they want to do this kind of thing. Biggest question I always get is, why is she not acting right? And invariably, you get the situation going, life is going good, and then she starts acting up. She's not doing the things she did. Yeah, I'm not getting that great head like I was getting previously. You know, she's, she's fighting me back a little bit. Every single time that's happened to me, I go look in the mirror. Guess whose fault it is? It's me. Why? Complacency kills. We're all naturally lazy at some point. We take our foot off the gas. We sit back, start reading the paper, and wait for the train to come. We all do it. We all do it. You're, everybody here does it in their own relationships. You, you back off a little bit. You start getting fat, dumb, and happy, and you let it go. A little too long sometimes, maybe. I'll bring this up, not just for the older guys, but for younger guys. Great divorce. The stats are out there. In the last 30 years, people over 50 having divorces has doubled, and um, especially the ones that are for only marriages. You know, so the kids are all gone. You younger guys that are married, LTRs and all that, you start getting a little older. You think, hey, we got this on cruise control again, and people are getting divorced in their 50s all the damn time. In fact, one out of four people getting a divorce today are over 50. So. Think about it. Don't just assume just because you got 20 years in, 25 years in, that it's all hunky dory. It's always going to be that way because it's not. And what do they say? Women normally initiate, what, 90% of the divorces out there. So you got to work within the frame of what you got. I get asked, asked fat, fat tongue here. I get asked uh, first steps. What do I do first? How do I make this happen? The number one thing you can do, I think, is to start off doing what we've all been doing here for the last four days learning to lead, learning to be a strong man, doing the things you need to do. Subtle things, lower the pitch of your voice. Because every time I get really stressed out, my voice kind of comes up here. And she knows after all these years that if my voice is rising, I'm stressed. That causes her to get stressed. She doesn't know why I'm stressed, but it causes her to have that same thing. The other thing that I see is um, in the old days, we'd be driving down the road and I'd just kind of put my hand over there on her knee, kind of hoping she'd grab my hand and put it on her pussy or something, you know. It's quit happening after a while. And I just had this little limp fish thing hanging. No, no more. I hold her knee hard. I grab her. I do things like that. When we're walking down the road together, I put my hand behind the back of her, you know, her lower back. I, I grab it hard. I make sure she knows I'm there. I do these things to let her know that I'm in charge, that I'm, that I'm there taking over and doing these sort of things. 
So it's a it's not that hard of a relationship to get into, but how do you introduce that to your wife, right? Uh, people say, oh, we watched Fifty Shades of Grey, and I kind of asked her some probing questions after that and see where it went, but not everybody gets into that thing. Um, we go back to that other slide where it said love and respect. There's a great book out there written by a guy named Emmerich, and it's called Love and Respect, and it's got some blue pill stuff in it. But I swear, it, it talks. it's written by a pastor, so it's got some biblical things. So if your wife or girl has got some little biblical stuff in her past, it might resonate with her. But it talks about, from a biblical standpoint, of women submitting to their men. And it's her duty to respect you. And it's the man's duty to love her. And what happens is that eventually both quit. And the wife says, well, he doesn't love me, so I'm not going to respect him. And the husband says, well, fuck her. She didn't respect me. I'm not going to love that bitch. I mean, it's, it's ugly, right? And you get this negative spiral going down. And so it takes one person in that relationship to flip it around and say, you know what? I'm going to love her even if she doesn't respect me. I'm going to give that a try for a while. All of a sudden, you're the person that put the brakes on the negative and you turn it into a positive spiral. It starts working its way back up. And so you'll find that it can, it can just be a hell of a benefit. And I call it DNS 101 for rookies, for newbies. Um, give your wife that book and let her read it and see if it's going to work for her. Uh, you read it too. It's a, it's a good book. I say some blue pill stuff in there and all that, but it'll get you closer to where you want to be than not reading it at all. So we'll talk later on questions and that kind of thing with this, but I did want to give you a couple of closing thoughts. I'm kind of, I'm, I don't want to get too bogged down in the whole DS thing. I just kind of like whet your appetite a little bit. Hopefully you'll get online, you'll Google a little bit, and if it's something that strikes your fancy. But first and foremost, if you're going to have sex, freaking protect yourself. Okay, somebody touched on this the other day. But uh, if you're under 25, there's a vaccine for um, genital herpes, little wart things. Not, not herpes, excuse me, the genital warts, the HPV. Yeah, if you're under 25, it's a shot. Go get it. If you're over 25, it's too late. You know, it just came out a, a couple of years ago. But protect yourself for God's sakes, right? It's one less thing you got to worry about in life. Wrap your stump. You're going to go out there and you're going to fuck, you know, fuck responsibly. Um, you know, you start wanting to go bareback and all that stuff, you're going to end up with diseases. It's just a natural thing what's going to happen. And again, protect yourself not only there, protect yourself with the whole consent thing. You know, be careful who you're, who you're putting it into. Uh, crazy bitches are everywhere. Okay, you got strength? These guys want what you have. They want your women, they want your car, they want your house. And what are they doing every day? They're training. The other part of this is if you can't pick your girl up and flip her over on the bed and manhandle her on the bed, you don't have enough strength or your girl needs to lose more weight. <laughs> Could happen. I'm telling you, explosive strength is where it's at. You gotta be able to pick her up, flip her around. She will feel ravished when you are grabbing her and manipulating her and, and talking to her, you do this, you do that, bend over here, do that, twist that over there, and you're helping her go. And she just feels completely owned. That's your job, right? Robert was saying it earlier. It's your job to fuck her well. Make her remember it, for God's sakes. It, you may get hit by a freaking bus the next day. That was your last pussy. How did it work out for you? Hope it was good, right? Okay, biggest freaking surprise of the 21 convention for me. I expected that gym to be fucking packed every day. I'm like, man, I'm gonna have to get up extra early to get in there before all those guys get in there and see I don't lift that much weight, you know? Hardly anybody in there, man. Five or six guys at the most every morning. I'm just saying, if you're, if you're not in shape, get in shape for God's sakes. We all talk about this stuff. Um, 10 years ago, I was laying in a hospital bed dying, which Dr. Glover and I have in common. I had flesh-eating bacteria in my leg. I was uh, three surgeries from here all the way up to here, opened me up like a trout, trying to clean me out, removing muscle, removing flesh, everything else. Uh, managed to live. And I walked out of that situation thinking, okay, I'm in poor health. I just about died. I don't want to die right now. I got too many things to do. I got, I got, I got great, you know, my son's awesome. My wife is, is awesome. It's kind of funny. 
even though we were doing poorly in our marriage, she had two different occasions where she saved my life, literally saved my life during this event. And I have a million dollar insurance policy on my life. If you have a lot of insurance on your life, your wife might not make those decisions if she doesn't love you very much. You know? Just saying. But no, she, she literally, I was bleeding out one time. She, she, she caught it. And nobody else had caught it. And at one point, the infection was spreading up my leg, and they put a Sharpie mark across here. And they said, if the red goes above the Sharpie mark, you know, get him over here and all that. And it did. And I was in denial. I'm like, nah, it's nothing. No, I got this. It's all good. So I do a blog thing. Oh, this got out of order here. Picture of me and my son were in um, Scotland at this awesome freaking castle uh, back in March. And our, our buddy Sam from uh, England, priest down in England, actually took a train up and hung out with us all day. It was a freaking epic day. I bring this to your attention because the men in this room, and it was just covered earlier, you got to hang out and do, guy, do things with guys, masculine men, guys that think like you. Get rid of your shit friends. You, every, we've all got shit friends. Quit hanging out with them. They're bringing you down. Crabs in a bucket, right? Pull them, trying to pull you back in. Get out there and travel. You know, don't have to have a hell of a lot of money to travel. You can do it locally. The United States is huge. For those of you, most of you live here. Go find things to do. Go hiking, even if it's just in the state park down the road. Get out there with these guys. Don't wait. Like I said, I, I waited all my life to get to this point. Not standing on this, this stage. But to get to this point to where I can be that elder that Hypnotica talked about, or where I can I can mentor a few guys here or there, I can help throw a few ropes, and it's it's something we all have to do. I got a little blog that I write. I mostly wrote it because my girl wanted to start a submissive blog community for like-minded women, and it was on WordPress. And I thought, oh shit, I better act like I know what I'm doing here. So I went ahead and opened up a little blog of my own. And I call it texasdom.com, and I'm not selling you anything other than some ideas. And um, I talk about submission, I talk about masculine stuff, this, that, and the other. But I identify with a Spartan warrior picture. I've never been in the military. I mean, my job, I work with military cops, firefighters, I do counter narcotics, you know, bomb squad, EOD stuff, that type of thing. So I'm around warriors all the time. And I identify with that archetype quite a bit. The code of honor is intense. Um, you gotta have a mission. And warriors have a mission. You know, warrior without a mission is, is dead. And I, I encourage all of you to find your mission. We all have to have a I found my mission a year and a half ago. I got on Twitter to look for President Trump's awesome tweets during the election. I don't do politics, but Trump. Um, but then I found a Dave in the back, a buddy of mine. We're in this Dom mentoring peer program thing. And he sends me an article from Hunter Drew. I'm like, fucking Hunter Drew's a dom. I'm reading this through him. Hunter, Hunter thinks like I do. Son of a bitch. He's a dom and doesn't even know it, right? Takes charge of his wife, his family, and all that. Yeah, Hunter and I are friends, and I'm, I'm jacking with him a little bit. But that, you know, Hunter always refers to Red Pill or Married Red Pill in, in a lot of his blog writings. And so eventually I'm Googling, trying to figure out what this is. I got a Red Pill and posted a few things and got my ass handed to me. I'm like, I'm out of here. You know, these guys don't want to hear what I have to say. And it's, it's, it's a brutal environment. Um, yeah, Ryan, I did the whole Batman origin thing. Sorry. Um, but, um, we all got them, right? Warriors, it's, it's the brotherhood. Um, there are brotherhoods online right now. Richard Cooper's got a site, right? There's a bunch of you guys are part of Rich's group. Uh, Craig and Hunter have got a site, Fraternity of Excellence. Um, there are resources there. If you want to interact with people daily on this thing, 21 universities got a million videos, you know, they're there. But if you want to have live interactions with people, there's communities out there that are of like thinking masculine men that can help you. Constantly working on improving, constantly working on topics that matter. Um, we have this phrase, no man left behind. And that's the other thing the military always impresses on everybody. You got a fallen brother, you got to pick him up. You can't leave him sitting there. Granted, we talk about handing the rational mail out when the guys hit rock bottom. And I think I've probably bought maybe 12 or 15 copies of the rational mail over the last couple of years. I keep giving them out. And I, I think one of two things are going to happen. They're going to read it, and I'm going to get a question back. Or it's going to go on the shelf, and eventually when they hit rock bottom enough, they'll read it, and then I'll get a question because I'll know they finally read it, right? 
So keep doing that kind of thing. Throw ropes where you can. You might think, hey, I'm just getting into this thing. You know, who am I to help? You're one more person to help. Everybody in this room is somebody to help. I expect everybody in this room to reach out to another man that's having trouble. I expect it of you. I'll be fucking disappointed if you don't do it. There's a lot of rope out there. Bill Foster's got about uh, 6,000 feet on a truck. We'll lend you some if you don't have enough rope, okay? Make it happen. This is an awesome book. You want to touch base with your, uh, your warrior side, Gates of Fire by Pressfield. I highly recommend it. One of the best awesome books I've ever read in my life. Uh, definitely gets into the whole warrior thing. So we get back to this. It's one of the things that I say on my blog all the time. You've got this. You know, you're, things are going through your mind at warp speed. You've heard so many things over the last few days. You're trying to put it all together and it's going to get overwhelming and you're going to start having doubts and you're going to start wondering if I'm on the right track and you're going to start doubting everything about it. You've got this. This is something that's completely in your power to exist and do well. I want to read one thing to you. I put a little tweet out a, a while back, and it, it resonated with a lot of people, and it's not that long. Humor me. I bring a message of hope. If I can unfuck my life, oh, damn it, fucking iPhone. If I can, I can unfuck my iPhone. If I can unfuck my life, I promise you can too. Dig deep. Find the bravery to admit the truth of who you are, that you deserve the life you have right now. The life you have now is your fault. Own that shit. That's who you are. Um, got off path. Dig deep. Spend hours looking into the mirror and analyze what you see, but don't spend your entire life analyzing what you see. Take some action eventually. You get that paralysis by analysis thing, and it happens to the best of us. Quit worrying about stuff. Take some action. Even if it's wrong, you can course correct later. Own your shit. There's an entire community of like-minded men ready to help you when you falter. But you have to take the first step. When you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, you'll finally do something about all this. Why are you waiting? Why aren't you starting right now? The character you have is what you do when no one else is looking. The little decisions you make day in and day out. How we treat those who cannot help us in any way is how we will be judged eventually. Throwing ropes to drowning men must be important because those men are important. Each one of you is important. Reach out, grab hold, and pull the fucking self up. We can't pull you up. We will throw the rope to you. you got to make a fucking effort. Pull yourself up. We're waiting. Come join us. Thank you.